So hello everyone, thank you very much for coming. I hope the beer, the wine, the water, whatever you are taking, it's good. Uh, my name is Asir Marso from University of Bristol and today I will be talking about tractor beams and levitation. And whenever I say levitation or tractor beams, everything is going to be acoustic. We will use the power of sound to hold particles in midair. Particles as what you can see here, like water, some microchips, this is an ant, some plastics, ketchup, mustard, all sorts of particles. This is a brief outline of the talk. I will start talking about why acoustic levitation, like why would you like to levitate things acoustically. Then I will move into how it works. It will be very brief, but I think it will be enough to get a technical understanding of how it works and what are the limitations. Then I will move into some applications. If you take a look at research, what other people are using acoustic levitation for. Then I will present some of our own work and it's a little bit different. We use acoustic levitation for different things than what other people use. We actually use acoustic levitation to levitate several particles and make displays, represent information, as if the tiny particles were pixels that are making the screen. I will talk about some challenges. Some of them have been overcame, like we have uh, advanced quite a lot, but there are still challenges within acoustic levitation. And then I will finish with do-it-yourself devices. I will present you some devices and give you an instruction set and also a website that you can visit if you want to build one of these things. So first of all, why acoustic levitation? And I like to introduce acoustic levitation as a new pair of hands. If you think about how we do science or how we do things, how we advance as a civilization, we mainly use two things. We use our eyes and we use our hands. We need to see the things and we need to use our hands to manipulate. And of course, our eyes were very good, but we, we need better, better eyes. And we have microscopes, to see the small things, we have telescopes to see the far things, and all sorts of variations to see the microscopic, the nanoscopic, and also uh, even the fundamental particles that compose matter. If we pay attention at, at, at our new hands, of course, if we want to manipulate big things, we have the crane. If we want to manipulate small things, we have tweezers. But then, there are other ways of manipulation that people are not aware of. Actually, you can use, for instance, a laser. If you focus a laser, very small particles will get trapped in the focus of the laser. And those things, they are called optical tweezers. And you have magnetic tweezers, and of course you can edit DNA using CRISPR. So what we are, we, I will be presenting today is what's called acoustic tweezers. It's using the power of sound to trap particles in midair. And it may seem surprising, but actually if you think about sound, sound is a mechanical wave, and as such it carries momentum. If you have been in the sea and there are waves and a wave touches you, like you, you can feel the force of the wave. Of, if you are in a very loud concert, you can feel your chest vibrating. And that's the mechanical power. So we will harness this power of sound to hold particles in midair. It's not such a strange concept. Even from medieval times, we saw these uh, schematics that basically depict, uh, I think it's 150 people, and they get around the stone and they said if they all play instruments at the same time, the stone will be moved uphill. Of course, it was nonsense. Like, uh, you, you will see that with even 10 times more power decibels, acoustic power than what they were using, we will be able to manipulate like very small things. But at least they had this concept that sound could push particles. And with that, I will introduce you one of our very first works. It's called Ghost Touch, and basically it uses ultrasound to paint or manipulate different artistic media. And this artistic media could be sand, it could be ink, it could be uh, different liquids. And in this case, you will see some sand. And on top of that, we have ultrasonic emitters. When I say ultrasonic, it's 40 kilohertz. So we shouldn't be able to hear anything. And it will be the same with these devices. You will not hear anything. And what you will see is that the power of sound can actually move the particles, the sand particles. I don't know if you can see on the bottom. And the good thing is that you can control very accurately the position and the intensity. And of course, you can use it to copy what you are drawing or just to have like an invisible ghost that paints along you. As I said, depending on the pressure, on the decibels, you will get different effects. And this also works in, in liquids. So what you may be thinking is uh, when I've presented this technique, 
is ultrasound, is the acoustic tweezers the same as just blowing air? Because it seems from that, from that example, you could say that oh, I could get a straw and blow from the straw and it would be the same effect. But there is a very fundamental limitation between just air and waves. We will be talking about sound as a wave. And what's very important about waves is that, of course, they have amplitude, how loud they are. I, I, I know I have said that you will not be able to hear it, but if we could, Amplitude is basically how, how loud the thing is, how much power the, the wave carries. There is also frequency. The higher the frequency, the higher the pitch. The lower the frequency, the lower the pitch. But the most important thing for us, it's phase. And phase is a strange concept. I will try to explain it. Imagine that you have two people singing the same song with the same loudness at the same frequency, <coughs> the same amplitude, same frequency. They could be singing the same song over and over again, but they could have started from different positions, you know, like some sort of canon. When one is in the middle of the song, the other one is just starting. And it's the same with waves, like what we call the phase is just at, at what point of the song. They are singing, all the speakers, they sing very simple songs, it's just like a sinusoidal, as you can see here. But for us, the phase, like actually when they are emitting, it's very important. And why is that important? Because waves will interfere with each other. As you can see on your right, if we have two waves, it's not that they always add. You know, if you have a wind, you have wind blowing, wind blowing, wind always adds together. But waves don't. Waves sometimes they act constructively and sometimes they act destructively. So remember, phase is very important. In that sense, sound is closer to light than to air. We will treat sound as if it were light. And some of the concepts that you can apply to light can be also be applied to sound. And actually, this is a very recent paper called holograms for acoustics. The same way that you can have light holograms, you can have sound holograms. Hologram is a very fancy word, but basically it means that even if you have a planar emitter, it's a 2D emitter, you can still generate a 3D field. And for instance, I think the most common example is Star Wars. If you see R2D2, it a has a 2D emitter and still generates a 3D field. And you can do the same with sound. Even if you have a planar emitter, a planar source of sound, you can still uh, create different 3D shapes. And this is the first example. All these tiny circles that you see, they are speakers emitting with the same amplitude and the same frequency. They just change the phase. And basically the color represents the phase. And I know they are emitting sound, so you cannot see anything, but if we could see sound, this is how the acoustic field would look like. It would look like a pair of fingers that is holding a particle. And it's what I've said, like you cannot see the sound, but actually sound can push particles. So you will see that just by changing the phase, we can move these holographic fingers. They can be moved around and also rotated. And of course, it's what I've said, like you will not see the sound, but the particles will be get trapped there and be moved. So this is just a very brief introduction about how it works. On your left, you have the most simple levitator, which is basically this one. You have tiny speakers on the bottom and tiny speakers on the top. This on the top will emit like that, and this on the bottom will emit upwards. And every time you have two waves traveling in opposite directions, you get a standing wave. If you drop two stones in a pond, at some point, you will get a standing wave, and there will be some points that they don't move at all. They are static. They are called nodes. And that's why it's called a standing wave, because some positions will be static. And it's the same here. I know uh, this fire diagram, basically the dark areas, the, the black parts, they are quiet, low intensity. The bright areas, they are high intensity. So uh, if you see it transversally, you can see the standing wave patterns. There are points of very dark, meaning very low amplitude, and points that are very bright. And the particles will get trapped into the nodes, into the low intensity areas. And you may ask, like, why is that? Like, why, why the particles get trapped in the nodes? So in the center, I show you the forces. And basically, there are two types of forces. The blue arrows, they are called amplitude gradients, and they are very easy to understand. Basically, you have the formula over here, but it doesn't really matter. It's just to explain that the blue arrows they are explained with a very small part of the formula, whereas the, the green arrows, they require quite a big, a big part of the formula. So remember, blue arrows, we call them amplitude gradients, and they basically say, whenever you have a particle in an acoustic field, it will get pushed 
from high intensity areas to low intensity areas. And that happens a lot in all sorts of physics. Like the particles, they would like to go to the lowest energy state. And if you put particles there, they will go to the nodes. So blue arrows, I think they are quite intuitive to understand. Particles get pushed from high intensity, or if you want loud intensity, to low intensity. And people ask, OK, I understand that, but why when you put the particles, how is that they don't fall laterally? And that's because of the green arrows, which we call velocity gradients. They are more complicated to understand, and also they are much weaker. So when we levitate particles, you will see that the forces in this direction, they are super strong, whereas the forces laterally, they are not that strong. And just to give you an intuition of when you get velocity gradients, is if you have two curved surfaces of high intensity, the particles will like to go to the narrowest point. And that's what you can see here. The particle is in the center because it's the narrowest point between the two high intensity lobes that you have. And you may be asking, is there other fields that get you levitation? I, I see you can levitate with a standing wave. Are there other fields? And if you remember the very first video that I show you, you saw like two pairs of fingers. And we usually call this trap the twin trap. And it's as you see, it, like it's basically two fingers of high intensity and the particle gets trapped in the center. Again, this is not the only way of trapping particles. We also have what we call the vortex traps. And the vortex trap is like a tornado of high intensity with a silent core. If you put a particle there, the particle will get trapped in the center of the tornado. And this is probably the easiest trap to understand, which is called the bottle trap. It's basically like a bottle of high intensity surrounding the particle. Then if you can see here, the particle is in the center, surrounded by high amplitude all around. So I've talked a little bit about the technicalities, and this is a summary of the limitations. You may be thinking, you know, how big the particles can be? And I would say that depends on your system. Basically, the particles can never be larger than half the wavelength. And for instance, if we are working at 40 kilohertz in air, the wavelength is 8.6 millimeters. So we can put particles up to 4 millimeters inside. It's very hard to get larger because for going larger to get la bigger particles, you would need to decrease the frequency. And then at some point, the things will become audible. You know, if you decrease below 20 kilohertz, the, the experiments will become unfeasible and dangerous for your hearing. So around 1.6 centimeters particle is the maximum. However, it's very easy to go smaller. And that's where the power of acoustic tweezers lies, to trap small things such as cells. Another thing is like uh, how heavy these particles can be. OK, they, they, they need to be small, but how heavy they can be. And basically, it's a strange because it doesn't depend on the weight. It depends only on the density. Because the forces that the particle experiences, they are proportional to the volume. And so is the weight. So basically, volume cancels, and you only get density. And I would say that the density depends on the maximum voltage that you are applying. But with a common system like this one, you can levitate 2.6 grams per centimeter cubic with no problem. And that's water, for instance, is just one gram per centimeter cubic. Most of the plastics, they are 1.5 grams. Um, aluminum is 2.7. So most of the biological samples can be levitated. And if you wanted to levitate heavier or denser things, we have some levitators ca that can reach up to 30 grams per centimeter cubic. So most of the metals can be levitated. Another question is like, uh, what materials are supported? And this is one advantage of acoustic levitation compared, for instance, with magnetic levitation. You know, magnetic levitation is super strong. Like it can levitate trains, it can levitate people. Why would you be interested in using acoustic levitation if it's only four millimeters particle? It's because it can levitate almost anything. It can levitate liquids, it can levitate plastics, it can levitate living things, it can levitate gases, basically anything below the maximum size and maximum density, you should be able to put it there. And one very important thing is that acoustic levitation will work in air, but it will also work in other mediums, such as water. Actually, sound travels much better through water, so it's much easier to trap particles in water than to trap particles in air. And when I say water, it could be inside your body. Basically, your body, mechanically speaking, is the same as water. So you will see later on some techniques to manipulate particles that are inside your body. But now let's focus on some of the applications that are common for acoustic levitation. And the main thing, simplest one, is what's called spectroscopy. 
Spectroscopy is a family of tests that scientists use to analyze materials. And it's, it's as simple as that. You get a sample, you shine whatever radiation you want, and when I say radiation, it could be lasers, it could be x-rays, it could be neutrons, you name it, any radiation. And basically, you analyze what gets reflected and what gets passed through. And that's used to analyze your blood, it's used to analyze uh, some chemical compounds, to analyze uh, pollution in the air. And one problem that people don't realize and they, and they start to do spectroscopy is that the, the recipient or the surface where you put the sample, it affects a lot your readings. Even if, if you spend a lot of money in very transparent glass, and glass that doesn't affect your sample, that is neutral, it's still going to affect somehow your readings. So as I said, the most common application of acoustic levitation is to levitate your sample, and then whenever you shine radiation on it, all the reflections are going to be from the sample. So basically, with acoustic levitation, you can get cleaner spectroscopy. And this is an example of a droplet of blood, which is being levitated to be analyzed. Another example is what people call levitated chemistry. I know it's a strange, but with, when you do some chemical reactions in things that are levitating, they happen in a different way. Like they could happen faster because they are catalyzed or they can take place slowly. And in fact, some microorganisms, they could change their behavior. Just because they are in some sort of microgravity, they could become like three times more aggressive. And one thing that we are still researching is when you levitate things here, it's the same environment as when you levitate things in space. And you said, like, why would you why would you like to do that? And it's basically because some people are trying to germinate seeds in space in the International Space Station. And they discovered that there are some problems, like the leaves, they don't grow well, some genes may be modified. And of course, doing experiments in the International Space Station, it's very expensive. So if you have some sort of system that replicates the conditions, you could do the experiments in Earth just for a cheaper. And that's also a, a family of things that uh, experiments that acoustic levitation is used for. It still need to be proven, like, is this condition the same as the space? And if it is, then you can do a family of experiments, just cheaper here in Earth. Another application, as I mentioned, is to move cells. This is a red blood cell in water, and you will see that we can trap it and move it around. And that's because what I've said, like, it's very easy to go smaller. You can trap particles of 100 micrometers, no problem, and work in water. It's even easier than working in air. And you, you may think, like, why would I like to move cells? So that's one of the examples that we are trying to basically popularize and make it feasible. Now, it's very common to have stem cells. You have cells that they can become anything. They can become part of your bone, they can become part of your muscle, they can become part of your retina. The problem is that these cells, they are, they are they just based what they do on their environment. They observe what's going on around, and then depending on what's going on around, they will get transformed into different things. So it's not as simple as taking a blob of stem cells and putting them in water with some nutrients. They will not do anything. You need to arrange them. And then it's a problem, like how you arrange loads of cells that are super small in, in the pattern that you want. So ultrasound, using acoustic radiation forces, is a way of doing that. You can take a blob of stem cells, put them in water, and then you put ultrasound at the sides. And that what will make, it will arrange the cells in a very uniform grid, as you can see on your top right. These are cells that have been subjected to some ultrasound, and they get a range into a uniform grid. And once that they are arranged into a uniform grid, then they can become skin or they can become muscle. And as I said, these devices are really strange because they are just super small and you need to look at them with a microscope. So those were some of the common applications for acoustic levitation, but as I've said, we use acoustic levitation for a different set of things. We use acoustic levitation for display technologies. And one of the very first tests that we did is, can you create a levitated screen? Can you put particles there and move them around? And although I, ca I call these things screens, I know it's still far away, but that's how we do things in, in research. Like you start little by little, and then you keep adding more and more particles. They should be closer and closer. But yeah, it's also the same way.
I know that doesn't look impressive, but uh, all the first displays, like the LCD displays, the first one was just like three times three pixels, and that was basically the same idea. You start little by little and then keep increasing. This is a, a different approach. You have different levitating points and they all represent different data. And the same way you can update your Excel and then the chart gets updated, this uh, physical system does the same. And we were just testing this for an exhibition because when people see things levitating, they, they were approaching it more. Yes. You may think, what's the advantage? So we still don't know, but uh, you know, if you have uh, some objects levitating, people usually tend to approach and see what's going on. And this is a, a very, very simple example. The good thing about levitating things is that uh, you can put anything in the, in the trap. Like you can put different sizes of particles, you can paint the particles, they can be fluorescent, you can put multiple particles, you can join the particles with threads, or also you can integrate these particles with other objects. Like if you put fabrics or metallic grids, those things, they are transparent to sound. So even if you have levitated particles and you put fabrics inside, they will not affect at all the levitation. This is another project that we did, and basically we discovered, you know, our levitators are non-dangerous and also relatively small compared to what was around before. So we were thinking, what sort of maneuvers could you do if you attach acoustic levitators to your hand? Nowadays, okay, you will see that we just levitate small particles, they are very light, that maybe in the future, if we increase the power of the system, you know, you can use these things to manipulate like very delicate powders, like, or even small things. Now, if you have a small object in a table, everyone knows that it's actually quite hard to pick a small object when it's on a table. So maybe with these things, you can just lift it and pick it up easily. So that was just a study about what sort of maneuvers can you do. And you will see that there is one levitator in the palm, but there is also two levitators between the fingers. And basically, after exploring what you can do with it, we discovered that you can do these four maneuvers. You can capture, and by capture we mean you have a small particles on a surface, and you can lift them up and pick them. You can move them. Of course, if you have a levitated particle and move your hand, the particle will move with it. But you can also move the particle el electronically. And by electronically, I mean that you change what each of the speakers is emitting to move the particle. You can transfer, you can have one particle on one hand and move it to another hand, and you can combine. Like You can have one particle on each hand and combine them. Sorry about the video, because everything will happen at the same time, so you just pick your favorite. And this was one of my favorite things, like the idea that you can move the particle with your hand, but also you can move the particle electronically, allows for some very interesting possibilities. And this is some sort of stabilization. You will see that I will move my hand, but the particle will be static compared to the table position. And that's because the, the computer system will apply the opposite of my movement to the particle. No worries, from this angle it's not very clear, but later on, yeah, see, even though I move my thing, the particle is still in the same position. So, those were some of the applications, and uh, now I will present some of the challenges. Some of them have been overcome, where others they still need to be surpassed. The first challenge that we saw is what we call single-sided levitation. If we compare ourselves, if we compare <coughs> acoustic tweezers to optical tweezers. Optical tweezers, they were super advanced. You can have a laser, focus the laser and trap a particle. And you only need what's called a single beam. Whereas in, in acoustic levitation, if you see these devices, they are called double-sided. You need one emitting this way and another emitting this way. So one of the first challenges that we try to solve is, can you do single beam, single-sided levitation with acoustic levitation? And basically, it's uh, moving from the devices on top to the devices on the bottom. As you can see on the top, 
the, basically those pink areas are the places where you can levitate particles. And on the top, you need to surround the particle with, with speakers. And what we wanted is to use single-sided. And okay, we some sort of somehow achieved that. Another of the challenges was what I've mentioned. Like you cannot levitate things that are larger than half the wavelength. It doesn't matter how much power you apply. So it's not, not a matter of power. Like even if you get the most powerful levitator, you will still be limited by half the wavelength. So what we try to do here is can you levitate, can you trap particles that are larger than half the wavelength? And we did some techniques to achieve that. So Basically, we use vortices that change the direction very quickly, and then you can put a particle there. And as you can see, using 40 kilohertz, we managed to levitate a 1.6 centimeter particle, which is not impressive on its own, but basically it's two wavelengths, and that's what really matters. It's in physics, it's all about the, the wavelength. But I said, it was more like a surpassing a physical limit, because as you can see, the hardware is super complicated. And one of the challenges that we are trying to surpass now is the idea of moving multiple particles individually. Now you will see that you can have one or multiple particles, but every time you move them, they all move at the same time. So what we were thinking, can you have multiple particles and arrange them individually? Basically moving from what's on your left to what's on your right, and that would allow for very interesting displays. You could have displays in which the pixels, they are basically physical voxels that are levitated and change and everyone would be able to observe these displays from different positions so okay that was uh, a lot of talking but i think most people came here to see oh I, I want to build one of these devices yeah so this section is what i call do-it-yourself devices and i will be presenting quickly three different devices that you can build at home and the, the easiest way is just to go to this website acousticlevitator.com or even if you type do it yourself, acoustic levitator. You should find one of these. In the website, you will find the part list and also a step by step video on how to assemble and also all the code and everything that you may need. All the levitators, they are pretty much the same. They use an Arduino to generate the signals, they use a motor driver to amplify those signals, and they use parking sensors as ultrasonic speakers. I know it's a weird, weird selection, like wh why, don't you use a, why don't you use a speaker, why don't you use a... It's basically because these parking sensors, they are the best value for money. They cost nothing, they are super strong, and they emit a lot of power. So this is one of the very first examples. This is what we call the tractor beam. And we call it tractor beam because even if you are only emitting from one side, you can still trap particles. And as you see, it, you see the video, basically we got you step by step about how to put it together. And what we discovered is that it was actually quite simple to put one of these things together and it was not that expensive. So what we thought, maybe this is a good option to go to schools and teach kids a little bit about electronics, a little bit about ultrasound and also some sort of maker project that they could do. So what we did is we put together 12 kits, these boxes that you can see there, basically contain all the components and some instructions and we distributed these kits amongst 12 families and what we did is you know you have three weeks to put it together on your own time you can come to the university these two days just if, in case that you have any problem and let's see what you do and it was it was good because we did this in association with the museum so we collaborated with the bristol museum and the objective is these families build their tractor beam and then they will showcase it in the museum. You know, if the university, if researchers, if we go to the museum and say, oh, yeah, this is very easy, you can do it at your home, you can do it at home, people say, yeah, whatever. But if it's other families, that's so, you know, actually it was not that hard. We put this together and it was a nice experience. So I think that helped to engage more people. The idea that it was not us showing the device, but it was other people. That was one way of working. 
distributing the kits and letting people work on their own time. But we also tried a different approach. We went to some STEM clubs, and these, these kids, they are between 11 and 13 years. I think those are particularly young. Even though we were scared, you know, will they, will they be able to solder? Will they be able to program? Will they, they do, by the way, you don't need to program the code is there, but uh, it's just if, if they would be able to handle it, they, they handle very well. So that was, this was another approach. We went to schools, and I think it was three sessions of one hour each that uh, we used to put together these things. But I think we realized that something was not that good, because if you ask me, uh, you know, why would I put one of these together? Like, you can put one particle, put it ups and down, whatever. I practice a little bit my soldering, my programming skills, but if you ask me, is there any real application? Like, I probably say no. You know, this is more like a toy, like it, it, it doesn't serve any purpose. So that's why we put together the second project. This second project is different, it's not a tractor beam. It's a single axis or a standing wave levitator. But it's more interesting because it will allow you to levitate more things. In this tractor beam, you can only levitate styrofoam, whereas in this one, basically anything that is small enough, you will be able to put it inside. Okay, so this is an acoustic levitator as a whole, and it has several parts. First, we have the battery, because this thing is portable, so you can power it from the plug, but you can also use a battery, a regular battery, as your DC control card or anything. This is the switch, to switch it on. Then, we have a tiny transformer to transfer the input voltage to whatever voltage we want to use. We have a tiny Arduino, which is like a very little computer that will generate the signals. And then, this motor driver, the big heat sink, this will amplify the signals so that they are powerful enough to power all these tiny speakers. We call these transducers, which is just a fancy word for speakers. These speakers, they only work at one frequency, and this frequency is 40 kilohertz, which we shouldn't be able to hear. But they are very, very powerful. They only work at one frequency, but they are very powerful. So if we switch on the device, now, all the transducers should be emitting. And luckily, we shouldn't be able to hear anything. Only bats, dogs, and other animals should be able to hear 40 kilohertz. But because the ultrasound is so powerful, if we put some particles, they should be kept in midair with the power of sound. And all these things that they are just being like kept there with air, actually it's not there, it's there ultrasound pushing them from all directions. And if we switch them off, they will fall. Be able to put it inside. Show you how to build a simple acoustic levitator. For more information, check the video description. It can levitate liquids and solids. <laughs> So let's get started. It's alive, no worries. Like. <laughs> and it's the same thing. It will guide you like about all the steps that you need to do. So this was a little bit more interesting because it was also easy to put together, but it has some real scientific applications. And what we did is we just distributed these levitators. And these are some of the users of the levitators, for instance, they are using it as a demonstration in some high-end universities like Caltech and MIT. They have these things, you know, when the first students come and you need to show them physics experiments. So everyone is familiar with the slinky, everyone is familiar with the standing wave, everyone is familiar when you put uh, the shatney plates, when you put sand on a plate and vibrate it. But this is sort of becoming like a new, or we would like it to become like a new standard physical experiment that you can do with kids. You know, like this is the power of sound and you can see the standing waves. So it's used a lot in physical demonstrations for universities. But there are also some interesting projects. Uh, some people are trying to levitate diesel, because when you basically set fire to diesel, you want to study how the particles evolve so that you can make better filters. And you cannot just set fire while it's falling or while it's on a surface. It's actually very good if you can set it fire while it's levitating and film it. There are other people, as I said, doing proton scattering, or basically any sort of radiation that you can think people will be doing scattering. Uh, yeah, some STEM clubs, some people are levitating food, 
I know it doesn't sound impressive, but it's very small things, but if you levitate uh, salt or liquids uh, like whiskey or beer, so they are trying to see can people actually taste those things. Um, the dynamic of droplets, some people are levitating flies. They get a, the fly when it's still a, an egg, or a pupae, they put it there and they let it hatch while it's levitating. They study, is it normal? Has it developed properly? And also one interesting thing is that while it's being levitated, you can easily record it from all the angles. So they were somehow interested, not much in what happens to the fly, but whether you can record it from all the angles. Because usually when you have flies and you want to record how they evolve, you can only record it from the top or from the side. And that's the thing, like if you are interested, you can go to that website and build your own. What I really like is that the some people took the levitator and actually did experiments that we were not expecting. This is what's called slitting, set, slitting photography. And the slitting photography, it's used to visualize the pressure amplitude. So you can take a picture, a slitting picture, and you will see the amplitude. Probably you have seen this. People use it uh, to see the heat. So you can rub your hands, and then when you record with slitting, you will see the heat going up. So one thing that we hypothesize is that you can actually record the acoustic waves, because they are, at the end of the day, they are pressure waves that basically compress and expand the air. And we tried that at university. We never succeed. But then one, one guy brought, actually, I have achieved it. And he sent us this very like, strange video with strange music. But I don't know if you can see in the center that you can visualize the, the acoustic field. All the other waves that you see, they are just the heat coming from the circuits. But that was really good because it's something that we were trying for some months at uni and we never achieved it. However, this uh, person at his home said, oh, actually, I've used uh, my kid's telescope because for a slitting photography, the most complicated thing is to get a nice mirror, a nice focusing mirror. And this guy said, oh, you know, I, I took my kid's telescope and it, it worked really well. And this is another project. This one is a little bit more complicated. I, don't, I only recommend this one if you are specialized in electronics or you have a special interest in acoustic levitation because it's not a single device. It's what we call a framework, meaning that it contains software, it contains hardware, and also applications. And this one is more complicated because each of the speakers will have its individual signal. In the previous examples, all the speakers were driven at the same time, like, you know, same phase. Whereas in this one, each of the speakers will have its individual signal. And it was good because it's a complete framework. So, you know, if you, you want to use the software, you just use the software. Pe some people say, oh, you know, your hardware is rubbish. Like, uh, uh, fair enough, you can use the software. And the other way around, maybe you don't know much about software, so you make your own hardware, but use the software. And this is some of the future work that we are doing. So we are trying to make a larger array that is integrated. And we're also trying to make experiments that everyone can do at home in water. So these cells manipulations that you've seen, you've seen that you can manipulate cells. Can we do a device that people can build at home to manipulate cells? And that's basically the last future work that we have in mind that should be released soon. Because it's just the same hardware. We will try to put, to put together a directional speaker. And a directional speaker is basically a regular speaker, but very, very directive. Instead of the sound going everywhere, it will be like a laser of sound. So only the people who are exactly in front of the device will be able to hear it. And as a consequence, it's also very long range. You can take this device and point it maybe, and still after two kilometers away, you will still be able to send sound to other people. So soon we should also release this. Speak up. And that was basically all. So thank you very much for your time.